the overhead. <laughs> You'll see things coming up at Community Bible Church. Just want to call your uh, attention tonight or this afternoon at starting at five is our our uh, CBC fun night that begins at five to seven thirty. Uh, if you have a question about what to bring, you need to bring you need to bring food for your family. Uh, and then some size meat to cook. You're going to cook your own meat on the grill, okay? Uh, so Tur turkey grill. dogs. What was that? Turkey dogs. Oh, yeah. That's what we're bringing. <laughs> They're affordable. <laughs> there will be other white meat. <laughs> what? Lamb. Lamb. How about lamb? lamb. That's white scriptural. <laughs> lamb all throughout the Bible. And birds. Some people would say that was a bad idea. Oh. 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 <laughs> but that begins tonight, and uh, we'll have the slide, the uh, the grills ready. We'll have some other grills to, to cook on if you want to cook on charcoal. Uh, so that begins, if you want to invite, invite a friend, please do that. So we begin at uh, 5 o'clock. Uh, teams, if you could come at four to help set up, that would be awesome. If you could be here at four to set up. Any other announcements that we didn't make? Gina. Yes, for the uh, Christmas play, which is December 13th, we're going to have a slideshow of uh, our pictures of our family. So in the next few weeks, if you could find some pictures of your family, it could be recent pictures, it could be pictures of the past, it could be an extended family, uh, it could be Christmas time, it could be any time. And uh, Morris Cook is going to be doing the slideshow for us. And he's up there. So you could, Morris, you could take hard copies and scan them and he could get them back to you. Or you could uh, send them in his, to his email address. And um, I think it's going to be in this week's uh, November newsletter that Mavis will send out. But if you keep getting some, gathering some pictures, and if you don't have any, let me know, and I'll come take some of you and your family. <laughs> <laughs> any other announcements? Um, so we're still doing the Operation Christmas Child. Um, I did write a little announcement thing in the November newsletter. Um, so the boxes are, we have two weeks, the boxes are due on November 15th, and donations will be due the Sunday before, I believe it's November 8th, um, and there was some boxes, um, there are boxes sitting on the table, um, this morning for a boy, and I just w didn't know who put them there, but whoever did put them there, um, please see me after church. Okay. And if you do donate, would you just make it up to Community Bible Church, and then what we will do is make uh, write a check to Samaritan Ministries. That goes to help pay for their the shipping of those, <coughs> those boxes. So all that will go directly to them. Any other announcements? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the United States of America, for our history, for the courage of those who went before us, for the uh, sacrifice that was made, Lord, so that we might live in a free society today. Father, we pray this Tuesday that you would, uh, first of all, Lord, that your will will be done, and that our nation as a whole, Lord, would turn back toward righteousness and seek you, Lord. Turn from our wicked ways, Lord. Help us. We are blind in so many ways, Lord. We are having uh, so many occasions, Lord, just turn our back on you. Pray for forgiveness for that, Lord, and that you would let uh, this election be a, a message, Lord, to our country that we want to go back to you. And, Lord, uh, again, thy will be done. And may righteousness be exalted in this land. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for peace. I pray for healing for our land, Lord. Um, and let us remember, Lord, that as Christians, we worship an almighty God. And let us not lose sight of that. 
and we need to understand and believe that you are in control, that this election is in your hands, and these are strange and scary times for our country. <coughs> And as Jeff just so eloquently said, let us turn to you. <clears throat> because you are the one in control. Mm -hmm. Not a Democrat, not a Republican. Mm -hmm. It is you, Lord. Yeah. And as Christians, we need that is what we need to focus on. And show that to the to the outside world. And Lord, I just I, I do just pray for healing and peace. Um, because admittedly, Lord, I'm scared about what is about to happen. And 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 I just know that when we trust in you, you will you will see us through. And I pray this in your son's holy name. Lord, thank you for the opportunity you give us to to vote in this country. That uh, it's a lot. It's a, an opportunity a lot of countries don't have with other governmental systems. And we thank you that when this country was established, it was by men and women who loved you, who at least respected you. And we see that whittling away every year, not just this year. But we know the outcome is in your hands. That for blessing, for cursing. Whatever is due this country, Lord, we know that the outcome will be yours. And I just pray, Lord, that for clarity, that no matter what the outcome on Tuesday, the outcome will be on Tuesday. That we will not, that, that it will be so overwhelming either way that no one can balk. And that the, your church will trust you for whatever we're going through. You will take care of our needs so that we can be a blessing to others, to bring others to you through your Son, by the power of your Spirit. We just pray, Lord, that uh, you know we we have we have our desire outcome, but we can't even see the the future for that outcome. So we just have to trust in your hands and your will, and be content no matter what what the outcome is. But again, just my prayer is, Lord, that it'll be clear that there will be peace, that the violence will be minimal, if any. Pray there's none, Lord, and no one be hurt. I pray that you will intervene for righteousness' sake. That you will defeat lies. Mm -hmm. You will defeat those who are against your word, against the church, and against Israel. That you will promote life and remove those that are promoting abortion. As we pray in the name of the Father, we do want to thank you again uh, today for the three and a half years that we have enjoyed, uh, Lord. Uh, truly, there is no man that we've seen in our lifetime who has been able to accomplish as much as he has in the face of evil. We thank you, Lord, for his stand, for, for pro-life, for, for Israel, for uh, all the conservative judges that, that he has seen appointed for those who potentially will be able to turn back so many uh, of the, the, uh, uh, the evil uh, laws and regulations, uh, Father, and uh, again. Uh, but there is still work to be done. We ask, Lord, if it would please you in heaven to allow the work to be finished or for the time to be once and for all turned back, uh, Lord, and, and Lord, that you would raise up uh, men all over this country who would preach the truth uh, in fullness, uh, with, with uh, unashamedly, uh, that your people uh, and those who are not yet your people might be drawn back to you, uh, Lord, that this nation by one, may once again be a nation under God, uh, and that it would be obvious to the world uh, that we stand with you and with your Son. Lord, uh, bring a revival across this nation like we've never seen in our, our time and our century. <coughs> Lord, you can do this. And Lord, as we prayed this morning, you are a sovereign God and we are your people and we are called by your name. And we ask, Lord, that you would honor that, uh, Lord, and demonstrate your sovereignty over it. 
And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Father, I pray too as we continue to thank you for who you are and what you've done that you would uh, ex expose the, the deception that's there. Uh, I think at the ballot box as there's been such attempts to um, to twist it such that uh, votes are not counted or extra votes that shouldn't be there are counted. I pray that you expose that uh, Lord, wherever it happens that, uh, and that in the process Lord, uh, people would would pay the price for their uh, for their treason, for their treachery. I uh, pray God that people would go to jail, that need to go to jail, that you would uh, allow uh, the executive branch to uh, exercise properly its authority uh, and not let the, the rioting and looting and, and all the, the illegal activity just continue without check. God, we also pray for uh, not just the presidency, but Lord, the, the House and Senate that God, you uh, just allow um, a turn toward conservatism, a turn toward righteousness, and a turn toward uh, uh, a situation where Roe v. Wade can be overturned uh, instead of just uh, going back and forth uh, uh, talking about it. But we're grateful for who you are, what you've done, and Lord, uh, in our nation. And, but Lord, we look forward to what we continue to do. And may it be that this country stands with Israel. Uh, and, and we're so grateful that our president has uh, has been a pro-Israel president. Not perfect, Lord, and I pray that as he continues to work with your will, uh, that uh, he would continue to be an even more uh, pro-Israel president. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Father, I just echo all of these prayers to you, and, and above all, that you will glorify. Mm -hmm. Our Lord Jesus is exalted. Mm -hmm. and we thank you. Amen. 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 Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I
some ways that you, uh, things that you do to remember to do things. What do you do to remember, remind yourself to do something? Write it down. <laughs> Anyone else has something different? You do. Set an alarm on my phone. Yeah. It's great for those things of year ahead. Read it If I'm aware, I can't write it down. And even if I can, lots of times I pray and ask God to help me to remember what I need to do. I have a birthday calendar. Have a birthday calendar? And that's my only saving thing. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Practice over and over. Practice over and over to remember. Yeah. Oh, I've got a great system, but I can't remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> I look at the scars. Can't remember. <laughs> Explain. Oh. Scars on okay. the hands. Not to do something. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Oh, scars. When it's burned, if you remember anything. Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple of those on my, on my hands, too. So, yeah. I tell, like, the three or four youngest siblings to remind me that you should do. Okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ uh, gave us something to remember. Uh, and wanted us to never forget what he did for us on the cross. That the, uh, the holy and righteous God died in our place. That he was buried. That he was resurrected from the dead. And that by only believing and trusting him can we have eternal life. He wanted us to remember that. He used the bread and the, and the juice to help us to remember. I have uh, things that I try to help me remember on a daily basis about about God and His in His glory. Every time I turn on the turn on the uh, light with this light switch, I try to remember that, that Jesus is the holy and righteous God. He is the one. Uh, he gave us bread to eat to remember His body. He gave us juice to drink to remember His blood. We want to celebrate what He did for us on the cross. There are two requirements in the Bible that we find that we must meet in order to, to uh, celebrate the death and res resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first one is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. To believe that he died on the cross, was buried, and is resurrected from the dead. The, the, the Lord's Supper is just for believers. And if, if once we trust in him, we need to, when we come before him, to, to glorify His name, we should come in spirit and in truth. So if there's any unconfessed sin in our lives, we need to confess that sin to the Lord. So as we're passing out this, this uh, the bread and the juice, I want to encourage you to go to the Lord and confess any known sin or just ask the Lord, please forgive me for, for any sin I've forgotten or I'm not aware of. I try to ask the Lord, Lord, remind me, show me sin in my life that I need to confess to you if I'm not seeing it. Reveal it to me. We want to come and worship Him in spirit and in truth. So as we're, Derry and I are passing out this, uh, the, the juice, we want to encourage you to go to the Lord in prayer during that time. I do want to remind you we do have this uh, all-in-one cup. So it comes in two stages. There's a little piece you pull off first. And then they, there's this little cellophane, and then underneath is aluminum. I would encourage you when you pull them off that aluminum for the juice, ladies, and everybody put it out in front of you, okay? And do it gently so you don't push it in the person in front of you, spill their back or anything. Uh, we're just, we, we've adopted this to, for, for sanitation purposes. So this, this, if, while we're doing this, if you just pray to the Lord and ask.
1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Holy Father, we do thank you so much for your greatness for what you did for us on the cross. Lord, only you could do that. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for forgiveness of sin. We thank you for your, your power and your promises. Father, you are a faithful God. May we be faithful in serving you. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Father. May we be mighty servants of yours. Transform our lives to bring us to be the godly men, the godly women that you have created and commanded us to be. That people would look at us and see a difference in our lives. And we can tell them it's because of you. Father, give us the boldness and the opportunity to tell others how they too can become your children. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Solomon's son Rehoboam, who followed Solomon to the throne, could not be considered a wise man. Some of Solomon's bad decisions had rubbed off on his son. At the very beginning of Rehoboam's reign, a selfish decision divided the nation. <clears throat> In his fourth year, he decided to turn from the Lord and worship the idols. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king, and his mother was one of Solomon's many foreign wives. Her name was Naaman, who was from the country of Ammon. She was a foreign wife from Ammon. Rehoboam reigned 17 years over Judah, and his coronation is briefly described as we begin chapter 12 of 1 Kings, the coronation at Shechem. This is uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> and Rehoboam went to Shechem. Let's go back to the last verse of the, other, of the, of the previous chapter. Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. Shechem was about 30, 40 miles to the north of Jerusalem, and it was a strategic city for this important event. This is where God had first appeared to Abraham in the land and promised to give him all the land of Canaan. Jacob later settled there. Joseph was buried there. Je uh, Joshua confirmed the covenant with Israel in Shechem when they came into the land. Shechem was situated in the tribe of Manasseh. Not, it was not in Judah, but in Manasseh. It wasn't in Rehoboam's tribe. It was in Manasseh, one of the ten northern tribes. And so the northern tribes and people would, would uh, be pleased with the fact that they had the coronation in Shechem. There had been some seeds of dissension between the tribe of Judah and the northern tribes as far back as Saul and David. There were some even before them back in the days of the judges, and perhaps Rehoboam thought that being crowned in Shechem would be a step toward peace and unity in the whole land. 
But the decision he made next, next that plan. Beginning at verse 2, we have the appeal of the people. All the people come to Shechem for this coronation, and then the people have an appeal to King Rehoboam. Verse 2. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard, heard it. He was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt, that they sent the people and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Jeroboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. And so he said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. You remember who Jeroboam is. So let, me, let me review for you. Jeroboam is the, one of the three adversaries that God raised up against King Solomon because of Solomon's sin. He was a valiant man. He was a servant of Solomon from the tribe of Ephraim, uh, whom Solomon had put in charge of his labor force. That's who Jeroboam is. But because of uh, Solomon's sin, God's prophet Ahijah had come to Jeroboam and he told him that God, that God, he told him that God was going to tear the kingdom away from Solomon, out of the hand of Solomon, and that Jeroboam was going to rule over ten of the twelve tribes. So that's what the prophet Ahijah told Jeroboam. Well, Solomon heard about that and he tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt and there he remained until the death of Solomon. And so what we're reading about is the story about how this prophecy that Ahijah made to Jeroboam is going to be filled, that's fulfilled. That's what we're in right now. Now, Rehoboam, did Rehoboam know that Jeroboam was his father's enemy? Did he know, did he know that he would be now his enemy? Did he know about that prophecy that God had made? Well, we don't, we're not told whether he did or not. But even if he had, he probably thought, well, that's really not going to occur. And, and certainly, uh, he didn't dare to openly oppose Jeroboam, lest he alienate all the people from the north. The people of Israel made, uh, uh, came, and maybe Jeroboam was their spokesman here. We're not told that, but perhaps since they brought him back, they made him the spokesman. And they protested the heavy yoke that Rehoboam's father Solomon had and laid on them, uh, including the high taxes and the forced labor. The people were wearing a galling yoke, just like Samuel told them they would when they insisted upon having their own king like the other nations. And so they appealed to Rehoboam to lighten the load and they would be willing to serve him. He could have won their support right then and there. But he said that he wanted three days to think about it. Verse 6, the advice of the counselors, the advice of Rehoboam's counselors. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived, and he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted with the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer the, this people who have spoken to me? How should we, how should we, how should we answer, he says, uh, who have spoken to me saying, like the yoke, yoke which your father put on us. Then the young men who had grown up with him, with him spoke to him saying, Thus you should speak to, to this people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. 
And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges or scorpions, he says. But Rehoboam asked for time. The time never solves any problems. Uh, it's important that leader, it's important what leaders do with the time that counts. And there's no evidence that the king sought the Lord in prayer about this decision. There's no evidence that the king went to the high priest and asked for advice or to one of God's prophets and asked for help. We get the idea that his mind was already made up. In making him important decisions, what do you do? How do you make important decisions? Well, certainly one of the first things we have to do is seek the Lord and His Word as we make decisions. Sometimes we need to ask for counsel from others. And when we do, we need to talk to mature saints who are able to give solid biblical advice. Age is no guarantee of wisdom, but age coupled with a life spent in God's Word, doing God's will, God's way, and that may sound familiar to you from last week, but, if, but seeking a, a persons like that, that's a pretty good bet for getting some pretty good advice. In this case, the elders gave the better advice. They said, be a servant to the people, and the people will serve you. Be a servant to the people, and the people will serve you. What could that mean to us today? Be a servant to the people, and the people will serve you. Apparently, that's not what he wanted to hear. And so Rehoboam turned to his contemporaries whom he knew would give him the answer he wanted. He had no intention of weighing the facts, seeking God's will, and trying to make the wisest choice. Rehoboam's buddies said that to make a show of force, you show them who's boss, Rehoboam. They said to him, require more than your dad did. Scourges. Uh, or scorpions here, probably a, a reference to that cruel kind of whip that had metal pieces attached to it, like in Jesus' day. Those young counselors were interested primarily in being important and magnifying themselves and their new king. And Rehoboam foolishly listened to them. Three days were up, and the people came back. And we read his reply, verse 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to, to Rehoboam the third day as the king had directed, saying, come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice that the young men, of the young men saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Well, motivated by pride, Rehoboam answered the people roughly. <clears throat> the way he spoke was rough, and the words he used were harsh. His father, Rehoboam's father, had written a book on wisdom, you know. And in that book he had said, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Rather than listening to the people and being sensitive to their hardships, he put his own interests first. The only thing Rehoboam succeeded in was alienating his suffering servants, subjects. And this turn of events, the writer said, was from the Lord and would fulfill his prophecy through a high church. God's judgment because of Solomon's apostasy was being carried out. And the nation was being divided. Verse 16. Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. 
Well, the consequences of uh, Rehoboam's speech were pretty predictable. All Israel, it says, meaning all those ten northern tribes that had come down to this uh, coronation, all of them announced their decision to leave the other two tribes and establish their own kingdom. They shouted the words of Sheba, not the queen of Sheba, but a troublemaker in David's day. And you can read these same words in, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. The words where he says, what share do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. And so they shouted those words. And they left the assembly and they made Jeroboam their king. Well, you remember Solomon's first first decision, his first official decision, or, or, or first official thing he did? Well, that brought him the um, reputation for great wisdom. Well, his son's first official decision told the nation that he was not a wise man. While still in Shechem, Rehoboam made another blunder. Look at verse 18. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, and earlier he's called Adoniram, who was in charge of the revenue. But all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam mounted his chariot and in haste and to flee to Jerusalem. Um, we're not told why Solomon sent Adoram to the ten tribes, but, but it, it, it happened right there while he was still in Shechem at the coronation. He, he sent them. Now, he was the, he, he was the, the man of revenue. Uh, did he send him there, him there to be a mediator? Did he send him there to raise some taxes at this point? If he did, that was certainly a foolish thing. Earlier, at an iron, is called the... Uh, the, uh, he's called the one over the forced labor. Was he going there to uh, do something about that? If so, well, that just alienated people more. They were, they, that was one of the things that they were most irritated about. And so the result of sending Adoniram was his death by stoning. And then Rehoboam took off for Jerusalem. Probably barely escaping for his own life. Verse 19, so Israel had been in rebellion, has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Now it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none who followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. So one coronation led to a second coronation, and the nation in that very short time now has been divided into two kingdoms, each with its own king. You have Rehoboam, king over Judah and Benjamin in the south, and then you have Jeroboam over the ten tribes of the north. That's something to keep in mind from here on out through the book of Kings. There, there, there's going to be these two kingdoms the whole way until captivity comes. And there are going to be 19 kings in the northern kingdom, the ten tribes kingdom. Jeroboam is the first one. There are going to be 19 kings, and every one of those 19 kings did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's why they were taken captive long before the southern kingdom, at least a couple of hundred years. And then in the southern kingdom, there are also 19 kings, starting with Rehoboam. There's one queen, so that make 20, but anyway, there were 19. And of those 19, there were eight good kings in the south. And so that's something to keep in mind. When you're reading through the book of Kings and you see it going back and forth from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom and, and telling you about the birth of each king and who their mother was and... and uh, who, and, and so in the southern kingdom, it's all David's dynasty. All the kings in the, in the south are David's descendants. In the northern kingdom, there are about nine dynasties. In other words, nine different families who rule over the, uh, the kingdom of the north. But anyway, all of this happened. All because Rehoboam had followed the wrong counsel. 
he'd used the wrong approach and he had sent the wrong mediator. What else could go wrong? Well, he could declare war. And that's what he did. But the war was averted. Look at verse 21. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. So Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom. 180,000 chosen men were, war, who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel, that's the kingdom of the north of Jeroboam, that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore, and this will surprise you, therefore they obeyed the word of the Lord and turned back according to the word of the Lord. This is the first thing I think Rehoboam has done right. He obeyed the word of the Lord and did not go to war. Having caused the division, see Rehoboam now thought he could restore unity to Israel by force. Yet after assembling this 180,000 soldiers, his battle plans were interrupted by the Lord's prophet named Shemaiah, and the war was called off. It was God's plan that there be two kingdoms, and that settled the matter. At least Rehoboam submitted to the word of God in this. Though what had happened was the consequence of Rehoboam's foolishness and Jeroboam's aggressiveness, it was God who overruled and brought about the division of the nation, thus fulfilling the prophecy through Ahijah. It was God's will that the kingdom be divided because of Solomon's sin. Now, did you notice here that every man, uh, each man, I would say, Rehoboam and, and uh, Jeroboam, both acted freely. They did what they wanted to do. They both did uh, what was on their heart to do. They both did what was right in their own eyes. And so had all their counselors. And, if, and yet, the Lord's will was done. Think about this. Our sovereign God is so great that he lets people make their own decision and he accomplishes his will. Our God is so great that he lets men make their decisions, their own decisions, and yet he accomplishes his purposes. What God says he will do, he always does. No matter how we go about what we're doing, God, what God says he will do, he is going to accomplish his purposes. And you see this throughout all of Scripture. If you look at each story, you'll see something like this. Think about the days of Joseph and what his brothers did to him. Uh, put him in a pit and then got him out and sold him to farmers. And, and, and the hatred that was behind that. And what did he say later? He said, well, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. See, God accomplished his purposes, even though those people were doing their own thing. Even though evil things were done, God was accomplishing what he wanted done. And then you think about a man like Samson. And God gave Samson all the ability, all the strength, and yet Samson used it for himself. Not for the Lord's will, and yet in the end, God accomplished what he wanted to. He, Samson died, but so did many of the Philistines. And then you'll find that, that kind of story over and over. And then make the decision, God accomplishes his purpose. God had told Solomon that because he went after other gods, he would tear the kingdom away from him and give it to his servant, meaning to Jeroboam. He would do it not in, the, in Solomon's days, but he would do it in Solomon's son's days. That's Rehoboam's days. He would tear it out of the hand of Solomon's son. And that is exactly what he did. You can count on God. Now, as we think about Rehoboam for a moment as we, as we, as we close today, um, we see that in many ways, Rehoboam was a chip off the old block. 
we're going to see that like his father, he too multiplies wives. And like his father, he turns to other gods. As we have seen already, Rehoboam uh, has little sensitivity to the needs of other people. David, his grandfather, was a king who loved the people and he risked his life for their welfare. Solomon was a king who didn't serve the people but used people to satisfy his desires and to build his empire. Rehoboam was like that. If only he had served the people, they would have served him. All of God's truly great leaders have been servants to the people. Abraham was, Moses was, Joshua was, Samuel was, especially King David was. But Solomon had chosen to be a celebrity rather than to be a servant. And Rehoboam was following his bad example. One of the marks of David's leadership was that he was willing to humble himself and seek the mind of God, and then he would pray that God would bless his decisions. Leaders who try to impress and showcase their authority and take no time to seek God prove that they don't know the most important thing about being a spiritual leader, and that is that they're second in command. That's right up there with being a servant leader. When Jesus, the Son of Man, came to earth, he came to, as a servant, and he taught his disciples to lead by serving. And he washed their feet as an example of humble service. And he wants us to follow that example, not the example of the great leaders of the secular world. Rehoboam and his younger counselors wanted to make a show of force and magnify themselves. The Apostle Peter after admonishing both the elder believers and the younger ones, wrote this, Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. King David was shown grace in spite of his great sin because he humbled himself. Rehoboam is going to reap the consequences of his pride because God resists the proud. And Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And he asked us to follow his example. And as we think about and we think back about the idea that God allows people to make their decisions and yet he accomplishes his will, that's what happened when Jesus came to earth. The Romans and the Jews did what they wanted to with Jesus. They rejected him. They executed him. They did all kind of harm to him, and yet God accomplished his purpose, even though those people were making their own decisions. And God calls on us to, to uh, be a servant. Uh, if you serve the people, they will serve you. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you at the right time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a great God, able to do everything that you want to, to have you have power over all creation because you made it. And Lord, we trust you. We trust you in these times when we think about our election. That Lord, people are, people are uh, many people are so far from you. And yet you're going to accomplish your purpose. And we trust you in that, Father. We trust you, even though there, there are going to be hard times when the end comes, yet Lord, we, we know what the destiny of your people is. And so we trust you in the midst of these times. And we thank you for your goodness. And pray, Father, that we might be like our Savior. And that that would be something that would help to draw people to, your, to yourself. And so we give you thanks and praise. You are a wonderful God. And uh, we exalt you. Your name is to be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. <coughs> well, we opened up for feedback. Uh, and I might ask you, uh, how might this idea of, of uh, you serve, 
you be a servant to the people and the people will serve you. How might that apply to us today? We're, we're, not, we're not kings, but how might it apply? <laughs> or some other, Rick? Well, we have a slightly different arrangement here than a theistic monarchy. Um, in our structure of government, the individual is sovereign, giving instructions to their representative in government. And we expect that our representatives would be servants to us because we're the boss, right? So that would be in keeping with the uh, type of thinking that we have today. Just like, you know, somebody promises to raise your taxes and interfere with your life more, is not a really good strategy for winning. <laughs> yeah, so, um, You've got a, a biblical example that can split a nation. Yes. So, it has lessons for today. Yes. And you've got you've got a situation in which you must make a choice. Well, they have Solid voters. Uh, what was that? I'm sorry. I was just trying to. I agree. That's why they have to lie so much. It's never gets right. That's why they lie. Uh, yeah, Derry, you're talking about the uh, leader having a servant's heart. I, I think back in my life, I used to play a lot of sports. I had a lot of coaches, and I remember very well the coaches who would, during practice, they'd get right in there with us, they'd mix it up with us, you know. And I remember a few coaches who would just sit over there on their chair, you know, like this, and run 10 laps, you know, do this. <laughs> And, and I also think the same thing in my uh, career, uh, different careers as a, working. You know, you got some supervisors who aren't afraid to roll up their sleeves, get dirty, get in right in there with you, and some who just want to sit on the pedestal and look pretty, you know. Uh, but it, it, but the, the thing that I think about that's so important is that Jesus, God himself, was willing to humble himself and come in here amongst us, mix it up with us, you know, uh, and get himself not dirty in the sense of sin, but, uh, you know, we're all in a sense kind of lepers, but he wasn't ashamed to dwell amongst us and to save us. That's a great, that's a great thing. It does matter. Yeah. It does matter yeah. even in, in our situation. Situation. <clears throat> Yes. I, I know we're talking about leaders like kings, but I think that uh, on a more personal level, I think that same concept applies to us. Um, even though the most humble of us all probably have someone that either looks up to us or we are responsible for, like the concept of children. And I think that if, if we as Christians and people as a nation had a, a, a more humble spirit of service of what we could not not just do for other people but you know how how we can help them how we can encourage them um, and not look for what we get out of it and uh, you know I think I think we as individuals and we as a nation would be so dramatically changed and so I think that's that's our response that's the lesson I, I take from that that um, while I'm certainly not the king I need to have that same spirit of uh, being of service and, and hoping and not just looking for what I can get out of it. And Jesus didn't just say it to the leaders, did he? It's for all of us. Yes, to follow up on that, I think that Jesus was when people see us um, trying to serve others and being kind to others, and, and especially in this kind of world, you know, just thoughtfulness towards others, it makes it easier for us to bring them closer to God and closer to believing in Christ also. Really important. <clears throat> this way. You know, it's kind of interesting, as wise as Solomon was, he was very hard to his people. I just have thought about Adam and Aaron. 
If he was ever forced labor, he was probably a fairly harsh, strong personality because you're not in charge of <laughs> telling people what to do, especially forced labor where you've got men with weapons there making them do it. Uh, well, you're not a softy, a patsy. You're a person who can take, you know, stand up to hard people and maybe you could have gone thought that this tough guy, they listened to him because, hey, I'm a little, I'm just a young man. They, they booed me, but let's send a tough man out there and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's not good, word. No. <laughs> yes. Oh, I think it's really interesting that Rehoboam thought he could take 180,000 men and fight against the 10 tribes, who, who knows how many men they have, and win just because that's what he had decided. I mean, when God told Gideon, you're 300 men, you're gonna win, that was because it was from God. And it's just like, only somebody who has either little common sense or experience is gonna assume, well, because I'm king, I can do this, and it's gonna turn out my way. I also find it noteworthy that he was presented with two types of advice. He had the, the good advice as well as the bad advice, and he decided for the wrong one. So that's a thing that oftentimes in life that we have the option of do, doing good and choosing wisely and disregard. And also, also the advice of old elders and old, older people that have more wisdom and experience, that's um, something we can take from that. That's a good, uh, that's a good uh, notification for us, isn't it? I can make some of you people are old. <laughs> <laughs> Good example. He asked, he asked for opinions, but he already knew what he wanted, and he had, and he was looking for those opinions that would coalesce with what he really wanted to do. Yeah. You know, I, I think oftentimes people will ask for advice, but they really don't want it. They what they want is for you to, to push or lead or suggest that they go in the direction that they really want, um, and uh, too often they really don't seek the advice with the intention of doing it if it is contrary to what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the case with him. Well, to that point, we see that a lot in the church now. It's very easy to find any leader who will say anything yeah. that you want them to say. Mm -hmm. So you want this position. So you gravitate to people based on their positions rather than gravitate to people based on testing what they're saying by the Word of God. You know what the Word of God says, but you want you know, in, in, in all sorts of sins and actions and doctrines and everything. I mean, you just see it a lot where you, f you find that. We're so fragmented you can find the answer that you want to, to support you. But I, and, and I think for all of us, we, um, you know, it's, it's so important to really ask ourselves, um, Lord, would you, would you leave me in this? And I do really want your will, not my will, but your will. And therefore, um, commit to him for that. You know, I, I really want to do what you say, Lord. Not, not, what, I, not what I favor or, or whatever, but whatever your words is and what you want me to do. Yes, Lord. So I'm trying to balance being a servant and being a leader. And uh, the thought that God gave me is, too many times as Christians, yes, we are to uh, acknowledge God, but we shouldn't hide behind Him. If we're going to make a stand, we're going to be judged, we're going to be called names, and that's where I can be a leader. That's where I can stand strong. It's standing on the things you know. God has told me that this is where I should stand on this. And too many times, I think we as Christians just say, oh, well, I, I shouldn't, or whatever. I mean, too many Christians are not voting. Too many Christians aren't making a stand or, or, or voicing what they know is wrong, what God has told us is wrong, to please our friends, to please family, whatever. And and that's a struggle, but that, that is where I can, 
I, I, I'm struggling. You know, I, I got the servant part, but the leadership part to stand, especially when I'm called judgmental. Um, it, is his, it was his own father of the road. Um, do not lean on your own understanding. And uh, in the council of many, there is wisdom. And I think one of the, uh, he was young, one of the errors of when we make decisions is uh, we go to, towards or we linger towards those that are going that we know they're going to say yes to us or give us the same advice that we want to and it is um, challenge to go to somebody that you will certainly say no to one something we are proposing and um, and listen to them and I think part of God's Answers are if that person really that it's against what we want, that can be can be um, convinced by God that what we are asking is good or not. That that change of heart can reflect God's will. It's I don't know if I am making myself understand, but um, it is very very uh, easy to go towards the council that would agree with us and uh, and um, it's a pitfall for many of us yes. and to add on to that I personally don't think it matters whether or not he went to the older people the younger people or really what position he didn't, he didn't even start off by going to God first once you don't have that basis it doesn't matter who you go to or go to if you don't start off with that invincible foundation you know, because um, he could have he could have gone with it, a closed heart to the older people. That's all he heard. But once he didn't even have his heart open to God, it doesn't matter what they said or his younger friends said, because he didn't have that faith. Good point. And uh, how how uh, how young was he? He was forty one. What 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 really youth? And, uh, but. <laughs> what, some y'all 41? <laughs> but, but he, uh, 41. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and, and so, you know, there needs to be uh, submitting to one another. There, you know, young people can be wise. You can. You can be wise because you follow God's Word. And, and that's the neat thing about God's Word. You don't have to be old to, to, to know it and to be wise in it. And so uh, their needs, and so and so Peter said, y'all, all, all y'all, he said, y'all, y'all be subject to one another, <laughs> and, and listen to the young people, and have some balance about that. You know? Yeah, the uh, thing that's interesting to me is Solomon's legacy to his son was an idolatry. Uh -huh. That's that's where it started, and it's interesting to me that. He built up this army, he got 180,000, he's ready to go, he's full of himself, he shut him down, and then he backs off. And I wonder if when that prophet came to him, that was the first time he had ever heard from God. Because something made an impression on him that changed everything. You don't build up an army and then one day decide, eh, maybe you ought to listen to God. I mean, that, that may have been the first time that God ever, somehow there was a power there that changed him uh, to back down off that plan because everything else leads us to believe that he would have just gone forward because he was just full of himself. That man took a chance when he went through. <laughs> and it was, I think it's obvious that the prophecy that's told to Jeroboam about you know, the two pieces of the other two pieces of the house of David. That was not well known or not known at all. Mm -hmm. Because if it had been, those old men would have said, and if you don't, uh, Jericho would have off the ten tribes. Or, you know, the young men would have said, well, we want to do this, but we can't because obviously the Lord's already supposed to. So we have the, because of Scripture, we have the knowledge that not everybody, the actors, 
you know, it, this was a thing that God had decided, and really it accomplished in a very bloodless way <coughs> where ten tribes and two tribes went, you know, separated them and there was very little bloodshed. And there could have been a lot of bloodshed, so. God said you should not fight your brother. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, have a closing. Let's all stand. We're just going to sing one verse of this song to think about as your closing thought for today. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Let's sing it.